Welcome to Conversations and Coffee, where we have conversations that are authentic, lighthearted, and purposeful. Our conversations will be engaging. You will hear from industry experts that will have you saying, whoa, wow, I didn't know that. Join us because it's all about you, your loved ones, and anyone who want to stay informed and of course, living your best life. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Conversations and Coffee. I'm Dr. Joy, and I am so glad that you are eavesdropping on the conversation today. Today, we have Dr. Andrea Zorbas, who is currently the founder and CEO of a counseling center located in the financial district of San Francisco, California. And her counseling center is called Therapy Now SF. Dr. Andrea grew up in the Bay Area and has been working as a clinical psychologist for over 16 years. It's obvious that she loves what she does because she runs a training program with her counseling within her counseling center and has a span of therapists from students to interns to postdocs and licensed therapists. Currently, her practice has 20 clinicians and continues to grow. Don't want to say too much about her because I want to give Dr. Andrea the opportunity to tell us more as we dive into our topic today, which will cover stress, anxiety, and how to cope. So wherever you are tuning in, get your coffee, just like I have mine. Dr. Andrea, do you have yours? I do. All right, and let's get this conversation started. Dr. Andrea, I've given our eavesdroppers just a snippet of information about who you are. Why don't you continue your bio by telling us more about your job and the services you offer at Therapy Now? Yeah, so well, it's great to be here. And um, so what we do at Therapy Now SF is we primarily see adults that are struggling with anxiety, relationships, uh, sexual challenges, trauma, and depression, um, work stress. I forgot about that one. That's a really big one. Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, so most of our clinicians do individual therapy. Some do couples therapy. Um, as of now, we don't really see any adolescents. And uh, like you mentioned, we have a span of where they're at in terms of their experience. And um, yes, yeah, so we have about 20 clinicians and I supervise some of them as well. And then I provide trainings once a week and group supervision. Um, so we're still growing. There's a big need. And um, yeah, it's going well. Well, great, because I know that it is a big need for, for therapy. And sometimes, you know, when you when you talk to other people about therapy, it's like a taboo, like, oh, no, I can't do it. But I'm so glad that I have you on today because I want everyone to know it's not a taboo. It's something that is actually needed and we want people to embrace it because that's what it's all about, getting the therapy you need in order to live your best life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think COVID helped a little bit with sort of helping with that stigma because it was something universally, the stress that we were all going through. And so I think that helped a little bit for people to be more open to, I'm struggling right now, maybe therapy can help. Yes, that is so true. So let's jump into this conversation. And I, I want to start with some definitions. And once we get through the definitions, I also want to talk about those signs of stress and or anxiety. So can you tell us what is stress? Yeah. So it tends to be an external factor. It's uh, considered a threat to our, our being essentially, and it can manifest in ways of, you know, you have a deadline for work or you get into a fight in your relationship and it can look like heart racing, uh, you know, your thoughts are racing, uh, sweaty palms, things like that. And then, um, yeah, so, and it tends to be more short-term. Okay. So 
if stress is short term, then tell us about anxiety. Yeah, exactly. So anxiety tends to be longer term. And so it's sort of like when stress becomes more chronic, it often then turns into anxiety. And that can also be an internal way that it manifests too of the racing thoughts, um, sweating, all of some digestive issues. Sometimes it's hard to sleep. Mm -hmm. all of those things. And it's, um, ends up being, you know, a, when it's becomes an, an issue in your life that it's affecting relationships and work and other areas and mm -hmm. personal hygiene and everything. That's when, you know, it's kind of time to maybe do something outside of, um, okay. friends and family. Yeah. So when we talk about stress, what you said was short term, and you talked about anxiety, saying it's more long term, but it is something that stems from stress. Right. Excessive worriness is the okay. definition. Yeah. So I guess you can experience stress and anxiety at the same time. Yeah, exactly. OK, good, good. That, that's good to know, because when I was doing my research, I'm like, OK, stress, anxiety. I've had stress. I've had anxiety. Am I experiencing the same thing? Right. <laughs> yeah. OK, super. So um, tell us, based on the definitions you've given us, what are the signs that um, most people should look for when they're going through these types of things? Yeah. So anytime you notice that the stress or anxiety is becoming too much to handle. So again, like your eating patterns change or you're not sleeping well, um, or you just, you notice you're worrying all the time and then it starts to impact all these areas of your life. That's usually the time when you know that, that something's not working. Something okay. needs to change. You feel out of control. Yes. Ooh, uh, I've, I felt that. I think yeah. can we, can most we of us have. Okay, yeah. I was going to say, can we say that most people have? Yes. At some point, that? life is incredibly stressful for some of us more than others. And all of us experience stress, whether it turns into sort of a chronic generalized anxiety is another factor. But most of us have experienced anxiety as well, to, you know, depending on how long that duration is. Yes. Yes. OK. That, yes. OK. Super. So are the signs, when we say that most people experience it, are those signs very no noticeable for the individual or is it more noticeable for others to see that you're going through this? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it can be both. Um, others may start to notice it and then mention that they're concerned. Um, I think often we have insight and then we notice that we're not our normal selves. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it, it can be both. The people who are going through it, do you feel that they kind of come on their own to get therapy or is someone else kind of pushing them there? Yeah, usually with kids, the parents are pushing it, but with adults, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. But with adults, you know, if you come on your own because it's distressing for you, usually you're more motivated um, and it, you have a better outcome in therapy. But that's not to say that others, uh, especially intimate partners, might say it's time for you to head to therapy and things aren't working out here. And then that can be a big motivator as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say usually it, it, the motivating factor is when someone finds it really disrupting their life. Yeah. That's true. And, and it's just kind of really, you know, like you said, noticing those signs that they're dealing with, because I am a researcher. And yeah. when I felt that I was going through some stress or anxiety and I'm like, OK, I cannot handle this on my own. Let me see about going and getting some therapy. I really started to notice those signs with other people. I think they noticed. Hmm she's feeling depressed something's wrong right you know uh we're not going to really say anything because we don't want to get on her bad side but it it was truly me being able to say let me see if i can talk to somebody about this so they can kind of help me go through this yeah yeah and sometimes it has to get depending on the circumstance but sometimes it has to get really bad for people to be like all right it's time for me to 
get some help. But sometimes it doesn't. People can notice signs early and then reach out. Yes, that's true. And I think with me, me personally, yeah. when I begin to notice signs of me getting stressed, and I'm glad you said it's the difference between stress and anxiety, but the stress is short term and it goes into the long term of anxiety. Because mm -hmm. to me, you know, people use that word stress so right. loosely. Mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm stressed today. I'm stressed about this. But stress is truly dealing with your mental. Am I correct? When I'm yeah. Saying? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, you know, they like one of the ways they describe stress is like the, the whole threat piece. And they described it like an ev an evolutionary piece of like if we're running from an animal and that those during those times, oh, that was a, a threat and that was to get away. And so the body still responds to external stimuli that's uh, a threat the same way, even though the threat might be, you know, like I said, getting your work in on time uh, mm -hmm. for your job. Let's pause and review. What is stress? Stress is a feeling of emotional or physical tension. It can come from any event or thought that makes you feel frustrated, angry, or nervous. What about anxiety? Anxiety is a feeling of fear, dread, and uneasiness. It might cause you to sweat, feel restless and tension, and have a rapid heartbeat. Can we really say that everyone experienced stress in life? Yes, everyone has stress. What is most important is how you cope with your stress. For articles to read and become more knowledgeable, visit our guest Dr. Andrea's blog on her website, www.therapynowsf.com backslash blog. Another resource for articles, videos, and coping skills to deal with stress and anxiety, I would recommend visiting www.verywellmind.com. Now let's get back to our conversation with Dr. Andrea. Yes. But the body's responding in the same way. It's releasing hormones of cortisol and it's, it's a full body brain experience. It is in... What I've also experienced, and I'm, I guess I'm just telling all today, yeah. myself, but when I've been stressed before, my my body, you know, is shaped. Mm -hmm. I have bumps on my back and I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, what is going on? Mm -hmm. um, and those are true signs. Uh, should that be alarming to someone when they are getting those shakes and then things start to pop up on their skin and all of that? Should they be alarmed to then know they need help? Yeah. And I think, you know, especially if it's persistent, if it happens because of a very obvious external stressor and it happens and it goes away in an hour or something like that. But if it's continuing and it's and it's disrupting all these areas of your life, that's a good sign to know it's time to reach out. OK. And most times when these things are happening or I guess if they're just long term, uh, what are some topics or some reasons that distress or anxiety is happening? I know when you mentioned your, in your bio, you talk to people about relationships and things like that. Is that yeah. like a number one factor for people coming to see you? Yeah, uh, I would say work stress, just we're located in the financial district. So we get a lot of folks that okay. are, are stressed with work. But um, no, I, yeah, I think relationships, absolutely. I think, you know, the making money and living a life and surviving is incredibly stressful and anxiety provoking. And I think that's a big one for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, just the the daily challenges that come up but idea yeah, relationships is, is a big one for sure okay. yeah okay i can i can see that okay yeah. So, yeah so now that we've um done our background work on th these definitions and signs that you have let's jump mm -hmm. into therapy yeah what causes mental health problems that's a big question. So there can be a genetic component to that. So you can have a predisposition to say depression mm -hmm. uh, and then it can be stress, usually like we're talking about, um, can sort of push somebody over the limit and then they can feel 
depressed or anxious. Um, and yeah, I think those are the main, the main ways that sort of mental health challenges and most of us experience some form of mental health challenge in our life there's no way you can go through life and not and escape that yeah. it's just it's a matter of what it looks like for each individual individual person and what the external factors are and then what your sort of genetic predisposition is okay so tell me if i'm wrong is it yeah. fair to say if you know depression or mental health issues run in your family is it fair yeah. to say that i will get it too not necessarily. Okay. Um, you know, there's so many ways to cope now. We have so much more education. Um, you know, we just, there's so many more resources. Medication can be helpful too. Um, so there's just, we have so many more advancements now. And so it doesn't mean that at all, really. Okay. Cause I've just heard that loosely as well. Oh, well, my yeah. mom was depressed all her life. So I'm probably going to be depressed. I know. And I think that's people's fears, right? And and there's, you know, some legitimacy that, that you might be predisposed, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. Okay. Okay. And um, I think we've already said it uh, earlier, but I just want to um, talk about it again. When you are going through whatever you're going through, and it is a mental health problem, when is it time to see a therapist yeah yeah i think well if you're getting any feedback from friends or family then that's a good sign if you're starting to notice that all areas of your not all it doesn't have to be all some areas of your life are different than normal so like your sleep is disrupted um you're not eating as much or you're eating more uh you're not taking care of yourself like personal hygiene you're having all these body symptoms um that I mentioned so any of those and then like racing thoughts and you're not able to focus and it's hard to keep up with work assignments and so any of those type of things and if it's becoming a little bit too much and you feel like you're just out of control then i think that's the time that's the time to do it and don't wait too late yeah Please the earlier you can do it, it. <laughs> yeah exactly the, the earlier you can do it the better chance of quicker treatment yeah that is so true but it dr andrea it is such a taboo yeah it's such a type taboo to go to a, a therapist yeah um and with that taboo is it usually the people that you see are they at that breaking point by the time they get to you often yeah okay. uh, you know living in the bay area a lot of people see therapists yeah. so sometimes i even forget that it's such a taboo and that there is such a stigma but i i know obviously there is uh in different cultures there's there's different stigmas oh, yeah. as well mm -hmm. and so and the bear is a very diverse place and mm -hmm. so you know it's still it's very much there and it and it makes it that much harder to seek help because maybe you're afraid that your family doesn't want you talking outside the family yeah. or um you know, there's there's so many factors or what your friends will think or what your family will think, um, or they'll be too concerned that you actually are getting help. There's yes. a lot of factors. Yes. And I, um, I'm i glad you said um, that taboo can range from cultures to even where you stay, because you're on the West Coast. I'm on yeah. the East Coast. Yeah. The East Coast, it's like, ooh, you're going to a therapist? Something looks right. really wrong with you. Right. And then you just said, you know, where you are, a lot of people do therapy and it's yeah. no big deal to do yeah. it. So yeah. you're right. Um, I guess it just depends on where you are. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, um, since we're in sort of the hub of tech companies, a lot of the tech companies now are offering free mental health. And so that's as of just a couple of years ago. So mm -hmm. this is massive and it's mm -hmm. totally changing the landscape of mm -hmm. therapy. So and I'm hoping think, they can kind of trickle over. Yes. And I think <laughs> with them, you know, saying, hey, it's okay that you go see a therapy therapist, then more people will start to utilize that. Yes. And see better stewards on their jobs. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that was sort of the argument that the tech companies made. So that way they would allow 
free therapy. Yes, yes. <laughs> they'll, they'll be better at employees, essentially, which is true. If you're less anxious, you're going to be a better employee. Yes, yes. If you're not worried about what's going on at home and at yes. work because you're overworked or don't have much work, then yeah. you, you are able to deal with that. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. So can you tell me um, when you have a client in your uh, office and they are receiving therapy um, and they're talking to you because sometimes that vision that comes up in the mind of people is, oh, here's this person, they're on the couch laying down and they just, you know, spilling whatever they need to spill and then they go home and the, the end. But I know it's not that because I've been through it myself. Yeah. What are some of those techniques people can use to deal with um, their stress or anxiety that they may be going through? Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the theories that I use is cognitive behavioral therapy, and it talks about if you can identify what your thoughts are, you can then uh, challenge those thoughts and that way your behaviors and emotions can change. So like we all have different thought distortions of like we have all or nothing thinking or um, we mind read, you know, we think we know what someone else is thinking or we do fortune telling where we we're sure we can predict the future and if we can have if we can have awareness and be on top of that and sort of rationally challenge some of those thoughts Mm -hmm. that can be really helpful in reducing both stress and anxiety oh okay that that's and tell me what the name of that was again cognitive behavioral therapy okay there's a lot of theories that's just one that i really like yes that's i i like that one too especially when you telling uh, about what stages that people kind of go through or what's in their mind and then how to help that. So what would be a homework assignment for someone if you were using that type of therapy with them? What would be a homework assignment? Yeah. So the other name for it is CBT, just the short term name for it. Um, And so CBT loves doing homework, the theory of itself. So it's funny we ask that. Um, And so one of the first things we usually do is what's a thought record. So we have people write down anxious thoughts throughout the week um, and as many as they can. And then we have them challenge those thoughts in the middle. And then what is the outcome of the thought? Um, how do you feel? Do you feel less stress, more stress? What is kind of going on? So just the first, because so many of our thoughts are just automatic. We don't even, for lack of a better word, think about it. You know, um, they just happen. And so we have to bring awareness to them first. It's time for another pause and review segment. What is cognitive behavioral therapy or better known as CBT? CBT is a common type of talk therapy. You work with a mental health counselor in a structured way to help you become aware of inaccurate or negative thinking so you can view challenging situations more clearly and respond to them in a more effective way. This has been another pause and review segment. Now let's get back to our conversation with Dr. Andrea. Okay. And you said in the middle, so you write down these thoughts and then in the middle you, did you say challenge? Yeah, you can challenge those thoughts. And so can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So it might be something like, um, my boss is going to yell at me because my assignment was late. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what is the evidence to prove that that's happened before? Well, there actually isn't any in the past. They've been understanding because they know that I have two kids at home. Mm -hmm. And so they've actually given me an extension for a day. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you're looking for what is the evidence to disprove these thoughts? I like that. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> and that would help someone eavesdroppers. I hope you're listening because that could be something you can be doing because mm-hmm. yeah, that can, um, cause we do have those preconceived thoughts of, of things that's going on and you're like, well, and I think sometimes my husband does me that way when I say, well, this is happening. He's like, well, what evidence do you have? to know that that's happening. So he's using that. On- yeah, yeah, he's using, he's doing a little therapy on you. Yeah. yeah, and then I and then I say, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, no, I shouldn't even be stressed about this. Right. It's all right. So people yeah. may be even using it and not 
knowing the yeah. technical word of what they're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> How important is it for a person to take care of their mental health? Our conversation has come to an end, but don't fret. We will be back next week with Dr. Andrea for part two. Our continued topics of discussion will be how important is it to take care of your mental health? What are some common myths people have toward therapy? What is a midlife crisis? Are you going through one right now? Or how do we help the 55 plus senior community cope with stress? And is it healthy to sleep on your problems or seek help now again you do not want to miss our conversation with dr andrea we will see you next time on conversations and coffee with dr joy don't forget to like and subscribe to my youtube channel and also subscribe to the audio podcast as well have a great day everyone and always nurture your mental health